Welcome to this episode of Flourishing Leadership. I'm your host, Guy Rogers, and our mission here is to help you unleash the full potential of your leadership calling. You can find out more about Flourishing Leadership at flourishing-leadership.com. My guest today is Janine McConnell. Janine McConnell's four-decade tech career spans successes from software development patents, big four management consulting to strategic global leadership roles. Janine's most recent responsibilities included leading a global team of technologists and strategic partners at ServiceNow, the company Forbes magazine called, quote, the most innovative company in the world in 2018. Wow, that's saying something. At the helm of Nexterity LLC, Janine has supported multiple Silicon Valley technology companies to optimize their strategic programs and supported a major North Carolina healthcare organization to reinvent their portfolio management approach. Janine holds multiple technology certifications. It's a long list, folks. I'm not even going to read it. It's long. <laughs> and is currently a certified OKR coach and echo listening coach. Personally, I have found Janine to be a real firecracker of a leader. Scary smart, folks, and I mean that in a really good way. Tenacious, intuitive, problem solver, and relational. So, Janine, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Flourishing Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much for including me. I'm so excited. I love your word, flourishing, and I'm just excited to be part of this conversation with you today, Guy. Thanks, Janine. So let's jump right in. When we first met a few years ago, you told me your story, how you rose in leadership in the tech world as often the literally only woman in the room. You were indeed a real pioneer and a great American success story, but on an emotional relational level, it had to be hard. Could you begin by telling us a little about this story of yours? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, went into technology in 1980. So I've been doing this for 43 years this June. So I was 19 when I started. So I was young. I was in the Midwest. I was the only woman in the room. And I had to very quickly understand a new dynamic. So throughout the course of these four plus decades, I've developed a lot of empathy and understanding around anyone that's being cast into a role as a change agent, a role as having to find some confidence inside themselves that they didn't know they had, and the ability to be what I, I like to call fierce. And if you look fierce up, it has a, a lot of different definitions, but I really like to think about the construct of how do you show up with a certain amount of fierceness that serves you well, that creates the ability to exhibit confidence, to exhibit the ability to convey your ideas in a very receptive manner, to be heard in, in a crowded room, and to really elevate the conversation, not only for yourself, but also for what you represent in the world. So, I mean, fierce. Wow. I love that word. That absolutely does describe what I know of you. What would you say would be an example of how hard it was? I mean, it's easy to look back now and say, I've done this for 43 years, but an example of really a, a hard challenge that you had to deal with. Oh, gosh. Um, sometimes I think I've buried them all just to get on with my life. But, I, you know, I've had situations where I would like to think this doesn't happen anymore, but I, I know that uh, subtly it still does that basically I was told that I couldn't be promoted because there were men that didn't get promotions this round. And so how could they promote me? And mm. by the way, these men had families to support. <laughs> these men right. had, these men have families to support. I'm like, uh, ironically, so do I, right? So it was back in the, in the day, it was much more overt, but I think a lot of these things are still happening. I think one of the big challenges that I've had to overcome, and there's statistical data that aligns with this, there's an organization called NCWIT, the National Center for Women and in Information Technology, that came out with a statistic that it's like 73% um, of behaviors that will be seen as a positive on a male employee's employee review will be seen as a negative on a female employee's review. Wow. The things that will win a man a promotion will be a detriment to a woman. And I have definitely lived that out many, many times. So Guy, you would be seen as perhaps passionate about your career. 
I would be seen as emotional. I would be Uh seen as hard to get along with. I'm too opinionated. You're strong. I'm opinionated. So have dealt with that literally, again, sometimes very overtly, sometimes very subtly for 43 years. And that's the thing I think that keeps me up at night the most is I have a mission, I think, to equip particularly women, but anybody that's stepping out of their comfort zone and into a a new arena, if you would, how to navigate that arena. But there are so many things like this that are literally out of your control, how you're Mm -hmm. being perceived. And so then it's just a matter of how do I not contort myself to be somebody that I'm not just to fit into what the world or corporate, I won't say corporate America because it's the same or worse in other countries, the way corporate thinks I should act. And so that's why I've done a lot of thinking and speaking about authentic confidence because really what we've seen is that you hear a lot about, you know, women in tech and women in tech initiatives and diversity in tech. Another statistic coming out of NCWIT is that nearly 60% of all women will abandon a tech career, mid-career. Wow. 60%. And what breaks my heart is there's so much initiative around recruiting young women into technology careers, which is brilliant. But it's kind of like I've seen at churches. You're out there driving church membership, but they're going right out the back door. So why are we killing ourselves to bring women into and encouraging them into technology careers if they're just going to hit a hard wall in 20 years and say, I'm out, I can't do this anymore. So I've got a lot of passion, a lot of energy about how to create sustainable capabilities that will get you through these times. And the way a woman shows confidence is innately different. If I tried to show up in a room and exhibit confidence the same way maybe the men sitting next to me are, it's going to come across as forced or fake or you know some kind of swagger that isn't really appealing on me, is not a good look. So I'm very, very, I've spent a lot of years kind of contemplating authenticity in the workplace, but manifesting that in a manner that does drive the end result. How do you walk into a room? And I used to laughingly say I would walk into a boardroom in Manhattan with 35 IBM distinguished engineers and distinguished scientists and me. And yeah. some of them would be women, but not many of them. And I would have to be at the head of that boardroom table and drive a two to three hour discussion, not for the faint of heart, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you get to that point in, in your career, wherever you are, where you can have the confidence innate confidence to do that, that is appealing to others. It's not off-putting. It's not braggadocious, but it is because confidence inspires confidence. People want to work with people who are confident, right? right? That's a huge thing around what I think about is confidence inspires confidence. So how do you wear that authentically? How do you build it? And I'll, I'll pause there because that was yeah. a lot, but that's really well, that's- been where I've had to kind of find out how to manifest confidence. And really what you're saying is there's a lesson in this for both men and women who are listening to this podcast, because it's for women in terms of, okay, how do I move forward and be authentic, but recognize that I have these ways that I may be perceived, but also for men, how you are perceiving women differently, subconsciously even, in ways that are different than how you would be perceived as a man. I'm I'm frankly, actually, and this is interesting, I'm frankly somewhat surprised that in our day and age, that still exists, some of that you're talking about in terms of how women are perceived in negative ways compared to men. That's quite extraordinary. It's definitely better, and it's, but unfortunately, it, I think it has almost become more subtle and less overt. Mm. So it's better, but it's not gone, and I think... Uh, Fields like technology, where it is very intangible. I think sometimes that even makes it harder. It's a very intangible field. We sit in meeting rooms and we argue about things that nobody can see, right? How are we going to build a technology system? It's very unique in that perspective, right? You spend all of your time talking about intangibility um, that's going to manifest as a technology outcome. And I think that it really breeds opportunities for even, you know, they talk about the value of diversity is bringing different perspectives and viewpoints and approaches to problem solving. 
And this is kind of the ultimate manifestation mm-hmm. of how different backgrounds, different genders, different, you know, all the things, how we bring problem solving, how we bring communication styles, how we bring language, how we bring body language, how we bring all those things to the table. And it's definitely still a work in progress on how that ultimately lands. So let me shift gears here to an area where I know that leaders who are, especially the higher they go up a ladder of leadership in our culture, have to deal with. And that is the whole issue of performance. You obviously were in a very performance-driven world. You still are. And the challenge that I have found with that being a performance-driven leader myself is how do I not let performance become so dominating that I lose relationships, that I lose being relational? God's been working big time on me with that over the last several years And I've talked to other Christian leaders, especially about this very thing. And so I'm interested in your perspective on this. What would you say to those listening to this who are, they are very performance driven, but they're running the risk of losing being relational in so striving to achieve and perform and and get success. What would you say to them? I think a little bit of it goes back to the difference. And I've had this conversation about six times in the last two weeks between a manager and a leader. People use those terms interchangeably. And they are absolutely, in my mind, almost diametric opposites. So mm-hmm. it's really casting yourself as a leader and not a manager and realizing, again, if you are in a place, I'm going to speak from this as someone who has a team, that you're using and utilizing the team to drive performance and to drive results. I think there's a lot of a mind shift of team performance versus individual performance and how do I bring my team along on this journey and how do I make sure that they are growing through the process that we have our eye on the prize that they understand without any I've always said my leadership style is extremely maternal like I will take a bullet for you I will step in front of a bus for you I Mm. will but I have expectations on you as well right? Loyalty, performance, all those things. And so when I've led teams and we are tasked with something extremely uh, challenging, shall we say, try to accomplish, it's really a matter of engaging the team at their core, knowing that this is a joint success and a joint failure, that we are going to do this together. And that I, I really, a, I don't really understand what lead from behind means. I've always led from the front being kind of, we're going to set the pace, we're going to fight the battles, we're going to break down the barriers, we're going to make sure that you have every tool and every opportunity that we can avail to be successful, and then give them work that actually suits their strengths, challenges their weaknesses, and keeps them on point to what the goal is. So it's really a hard thing if you're kind of a control freak, which I am, um, (laughs) and when you, you realize that, you know, uh, buck stops here to kind of peel the fingers of control off a little bit and bring the team along. But several years ago, I've gotten kind of uh, hit around the head with um, outliving your life. I just saw that on a a great uh, video I was watching. How do you outlive your life, right? And how do you focus more on eulogy planning than resume planning? And so when you think about being a performance-driven leader in an organization, Five years from now, probably nobody is going to remember the project that you worked on and was it successful or was it a failure? But five years from now, the people that worked around you and the people that you led are going to remember the experience they took away from that time. Mm. And that is how I want to outlive my life. And I've been very blessed to have I have somebody reach out to me from a company I left over 20 years ago posted a post on LinkedIn and said, I do need you to know that even though you've been gone for 20 years, there's probably not a week that your name doesn't come up. And this was the company that told me that they couldn't promote me because I was just a girl, right? <laughs> and so I was working under under those kind of constraints, but I've really shifted my focus from performance is clearly I'm all about getting the job done and, and being successful is paramount. I always have this kind of joke, don't ask me to be involved with this project if you really don't want it to succeed because it wow. will, by golly, one way or the other, we're going to get this thing done. And I have been involved with projects where they really didn't want it to succeed. And that's a whole nother story. But what is most important at the end of it all 
is the performance that elevated and equipped those around you, whether it was peers, maybe it's even your boss, but the team that you've been granted for this minute on this earth to be the shepherd of, what difference did you make in their life? And five years later, are they still talking about, do you remember what you taught me on that project? I use it every day. So for me, that's the ultimate performance is what did I pour into the teams that we took along the way to be successful? What you just said reminded me of a personal experience. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, performance being performance driven has been an aspect of my life that I've had to really work with and work on. At times, it's been difficult because I was so performance driven that I lost sight of people. And years ago, as I started recognizing this, I began to do things intentionally to try to change that. And this is a quick anecdote experience that I had that showed me that I was, in fact, making some progress in this area is what you said about, you know, equipping people, helping them and, you know, what they say about you years later. I left a particular organization I'd been the executive director of, had been there over six years. And the day I left the office, I had my stuff packed up, went out to the car and one of the staff came out, a woman who'd worked there five years, and she gave me a big hug. And she said, my working here has not only helped me become better at doing this work, I'm a better person because of this. Mm. That was probably as gratifying yep. or more gratifying yep. than any of the successes we had. And we had a lot of them as an organization. And it has stuck with me to yeah, this I, day. It literally I left a down. job as it. Yeah, it, it almost gives me goosebumps right now. I'll, I'll admit thinking about it because it was so unsolicited and so gratifying and such a reinforcement to me that guy, yeah, you're not just stuck where you were. <laughs> you have actually been moving away from being this hard driving performance driven guy to someone who cares about the people who are part of his team. That was huge. Yeah. I, I left a job as a chief of staff of CIO who are usually very tacit and very men and women, a few words because of just the nature of the role that they have to do, chief information officer, CIO. Mm -hmm. And when I left, um, he sat in my office and said, of all the things you fixed and changed while you were here, you changed our culture the most. And that is the most important thing. And I think, you know, performance right now, people are exhausted. They're overwrought. You you hear about quiet kid quitting, which is literally nothing more than being checked out, frankly. So people are looking for hope. They're looking for things that they can use to better their lot, right? Tools that they can equip to do their jobs. And so when you can not only be successful with the projects or the work or the initiatives that you've been tasked with, but bring the team along and raise them to a higher level of performance and standard, that's just win, win, win all the way across the board. Win, win, win. That was one of the things that I've been learning over the years was that having success is not mutually exclusive from actually helping people and working and caring about people. That was a real revelation for me because it was always the task, the goal, the outcome was the driver. And to realize that the two actually can go hand in hand is far more rewarding than operating in a solely performance-driven mindset, for sure. Well, and there's a an adrenaline win, right? There's an endorphin of the conquest. Yay, we we did great on this project, but there have been, I've read this great book called Strength to Strength. I'd like to recommend to your readers by Alfred Brooks. And it talks about just scientifically how quick that endorphin buzz wears off. And that just sends you driving for the next conquest and the next achievement and the next award and the next promotion that that endorphin doesn't last. It's kind of a, you know, a corporate drug, if you would, but the joy of moving people forward, of progressing them, of making it a, a bigger than the project, that doesn't fade. Boy, that is so true, Janine. I have to say, you know, I worked in the world of politics for years and, you know, election day is like, you win, you lose, you exceed expectations, you don't exceed expectations. <laughs> And I remember in a particular instance where we had just accomplished this huge thing, surprised the pundits, did things that nobody expected. It was on a presidential campaign. And all I felt was relief. I didn't feel joy. Yeah. I didn't it's feel- It's over. Like, thank goodness. It's over. And yeah. thank God I didn't fail. <laughs> that was part of that process yeah. of going, is this as good as it gets? 
those types of experiences started creating, as well as other people pointing things out to me and showing me things, some examining of myself of what was really driving me. And that your point about the endorphin that, yeah, you get there and then, okay, it's a drug, but then you need more. It's never enough. Mm -hmm. It's never enough. And and the challenge with that is what I'm seeing now at uh, in my early sixties, I live amongst a lot of young retirees and which is actually what sent me to read that book is, well, what happens when that venue to get your hit is gone? Now yeah. you don't have the next promotion. You don't have the next project. You don't have the next corporate award to get your fix. What's your fix now? How do you reconcile that in your new life when you no longer are fully identifying as I am a chief financial officer? I am a director of sales. I am a, right? Now that crash is is hard for a lot of people. So that's another area that I'm really kind of a little bit living myself, but also developing some content and some work around because I see it left and right. I saw that a lot when I was the CEO at Pinnacle Forum and around a lot of Mm -hmm. leaders who were in their 60s and they'd sold the business or had quote unquote retired, you know, that type of thing. And all of a sudden their identity is being challenged because their identity was so merged with their roles that they had a hard time seeing themselves as extricated from that role. It was a real struggle for them. And I have to confess, I've had to deal with it some myself after yeah, I left. I so that's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a real thing. It's a it real is. thing. It is a real thing for sure. So I want to come to a, an area now where, and I have been intentional about asking each of my guests about this because of the nature of where the culture is today. You look back, say, six decades ago, and no matter where you lived, in most places of the country, it was really expected of you in business or if you were a corporate leader, you attended church. Even if you didn't really believe it, you did it because that's what people did. It was the culture, especially where you live now in the southern part of the country. That was definitely the case. There was a cultural pressure to do so. Today, we live in the polar opposite of that. Today, that, you know, if I go to church or I profess to be a Christian, is not seen in many cases, if not most cases, in the marketplace world, not seen as a positive. It's seen as a negative. There's an immediate, oh, you are like this. You're intolerant or you're a hater or whatever, whatever pejorative comes up. So in the world you are, as a Christian, and having to deal with the realities of this white hostility to Christianity, to faith, what would be your advice to Christian marketplace leaders as to how they can stay true to their faith and yet still navigate this particularly difficult minefield we call the marketplace business culture today? It's a great question. I've worked all of my life in technology the last decade and a half in Silicon Valley, which is where we might argue when we see air quotes, big tech, you know, flashed about on all of our social media sites and news pages, that is the epicenter of air quotes, big tech. So it's been an interesting time to watch this spiral as you kind of call it out and how it has changed even in the last 15 years. So what I have really tried to do kind of, again, not to sound incredibly altruistic or whatever, but kind of somewhat similar to my previous answer is I do believe that um, I I had a comment once I was doing some work with Dale Carnegie in St. Louis, and they said that they were kind of a a front organization, a, a ruse. I love this. They said that we are actually undercover missionaries to the wilds of American business. Hmm. So that's kind of what I've always kind of called myself that I'm, I'm on a mission to the wilds of American business. And it has been, interesting how God has brought people to me in airport lounges and bars and taxis and boardrooms that are really realizing that there has got to be more to this life and wanting to understand why are you different? Why do you exude a calm that others don't? Why do you have a peace about you that others don't? So I think, was it uh, Spurgeon or C.S. Lewis, and probably neither, that said, you may be the only Bible that some people will ever read. Right. So I think the best advice I'd have for Christians trying to navigate this very bizarre kind of world we find ourselves in is certainly not telling anyone to not be overt and witnessing to people, but to really let your uh, salt and light 
be the enticement. The world is looking for a, you know, a, a joy that doesn't come from a drug and, and a peace that doesn't come from the government and a, and a hope that they're just literally almost more every day not seen. And, you know, we have layoffs and we have corporate shake up and we have crazy bosses and that search for self through career, which is where most people spend it, comes up short every time. Right. And so I think your position in corporate, whether it's America or Europe, because they're all the same, is really to be position yourself as a ministry, as an evangelist, as a missionary to these people who, uh, I remember the people at Dale Carnegie said, not everyone who's down and out is sitting on a street corner with a bottle in a bag. Some of the most down and out people we find are wearing $2,000 suits. And so it's really to look at every opportunity you have to make people question, why are you different? What is it about you? How can I have your calm? How can I have your hope? How can I have your peace? Where does that come from? Because I'm not seeing it in the world. And it's hard sometimes not to compromise your faith. It's hard sometimes not to have yourself have to attend meetings that fly heavily in the face of what you believe, particularly the more, I guess, air quotes, woke your company is. So that's come becomes a personal decision of how far do you let that infringe on your benefits and what, you know, how much are you willing to sacrifice to stand up against that. So I'm, I'm certainly not implying that there isn't a line that we all can't cross, but I am implying that your presence is is salt and it is light in a very dark and decaying world. And we just did a big study in our church on the Sermon on the Mount and really dug into salt and light. And the reason salt was so important in that economy is it it warded off rot. Right. And literally, that's what Jesus is telling us, to be the preservative that wards off the rot of this dying world. And so, how are you a light that points them to Christ? And how are you a preservative that's staying off the decay of this world one more day in wherever God has placed you as your mission field in your career? You know, you're talking about that. Reminds me, I have a client who's a C-level executive of a multi-billion dollar company. And he told me about how another C-level executive in that company, in a few minutes of real open transparency, talked about how miserable his life had become. His personal life, it was a mess. So you're right. The $2,000 suit doesn't necessarily mean that that person isn't down and out you know, in their life where they are. And right. in fact, it can actually be Really, really. And, and I think I had a friend, um, a dear, dear friend, and very devout Christian, who works in not only tech but the video aspect of tech, which is kind of a double whammy, kind of media and tech all in one. And he found himself without a job, and um, got kind of pulled into a spontaneous interview with the CEO of a company that he didn't know was going to happen. So he wasn't super well prepared. It was just kind of a friend of a friend, and hey, let's talk to my boss. We'd love to bring you in. And the boss asked him, you know, over a Zoom call or over a phone call, if money wasn't an object, what would you be doing with your life? And he's like, oh, well, I'd be creating these great videos and I'd be doing this. And he's like, no, you didn't hear my question. I said, if money wasn't an object, what would you be doing with your life? And he said, I don't know how it came out. I don't know where it came from. But he said, I would be an evangelist for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. And then he put his hand over his mouth and he's like, what the... What did I just say? <laughs> what did I just say? What did I just say? And where did that come? I mean, clearly it was the truth, but it certainly wasn't anything premeditated that he intended to blurt out in an interview with a CEO. And that actually the CEO kind of rolled the camera back and showed him the plaque that he had above the wall behind his desk. And it was scripture. And he was like, thank you for having the boldness to speak that. Thank you. And so I, I just bring that up as an encouragement that God will be with you in those opportunities. And sometimes it may win you the job. Sometimes it may cost you the job, but this is not all there is. So what are you doing in your mission field where you've been planted to be that salt and light? And sometimes it takes just opening your mouth up and letting God speak through you, which I think clearly is what happened to my friend there. Right. <laughs> I can picture that, you know, the way you described it. It's like right there. You can see it. Yeah. 
Janine, any last thoughts that you want to share before I close this podcast out? Um, just again, thank you very much for including me. Thank you for your heart. I, you know, the four or five years that we've known each other, your heart for the challenge of being, I think when we had our first conversation and it still resonates was it's hard to be a, a God follower in a business leadership position. And it's hard to be a business leader in your faith sometimes. Remember that whole conversation we had about you're too churchy for the business and you're too businessy, too businessy for the church. Right. And so I just thank you for, you know, really kind of planting that seed with me to think about how do we balance those two halves of our lives, which really should be one whole, but sometimes we see them as two different things. And so thank you again for including me in this conversation and kind of reminding me to rethink about that, you know that wholeness of, of self, that it's not compartmentalization, it's actually wholeness of self between your faith walk and your career walk. And how does that become fully integrated and not at the expense of either? So thank you again. Janine, this has been a real delight uh, having this conversation. And I will say you are an inspiration to us. You've been an inspiration to me, your story. I'm sure that those who are listening are feeling the same way. So thank you for joining us in the podcast. Thank you so much. As a certified professional leadership coach, I have the privilege of working with leaders of all ages and backgrounds, people like Janine McConnell, C-level executives, nonprofit leaders, small business owners, self-employed professionals. I'm passionately driven to help each of these men and women be better servant leaders every day. In this podcast, my goal is to help you, the listener, do the same. That's my calling. That's my mission. If my message today speaks to you, please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app, different platforms, and go to iTunes, Play Stores, Stitcher, Spotify, others. Let your friends and colleagues know about this. And please go check out our website, flourishing-leadership.com, where you can learn more about my leadership coaching approach and methodology and how it could be of help and service to you. Why? Because today, your leadership, flourishing leadership, has never been more needed.